Welcome everybody to our July 21st Midday Science Cafe. We are excited to be here one more month with you with Nicholas Caravolius and Thomas Ang to present Combating Climate Change with CRISPR. Before we get started, as usual, we like to do a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people. The, excuse me, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you, as usual, for allowing me to take a moment to do that land acknowledgement. Before we get started, I will also note that we have a program ne next month, Material Science for Sustainability on August 18th featuring two fabulous researchers, one at Berkeley and one at Berkeley Lab. Um, and I also uh, wanna mention that there are a few things to take note of. One is that live transcription is available through closed captioning, closed captioning which you can find uh, via the Zoom panel at the bottom of your screen. This uh, event is also being recorded. So we will send this to all of you who are joining today. We will also send it to anyone who RSVP'd and it will show up on all of our YouTube channels. It will show up on Twitter, our newsletters, everything. So you can forward on to your friends or watch it again. Uh, please remember to ask questions in our chat boxes or in the Q&A box. Um, and that's all of the sort of logistics I wanted to get into before I introduce Science at Cal. I'm the executive director of Science at Cal. My name is Dion Rossiter, and we are half of the program um, staff that brings you uh, Midday Science Cafe. In 2008, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise public awareness and understanding and appreciation of scientific research at Berkeley. And to realize this vision, we engage the vast Berkeley STEM community as science communicators and foster creative collaborations among campus and community-based groups who share a commitment to equity and inclusion and STEM education and STEM careers. Science at Cal connects UC Berkeley scientists and technology and engineers, researchers with the diverse community groups of all ages and backgrounds for science engagement and science learning, accessibility, inclusiveness, creative creativity, and innovation are all hallmarks of Science at Cal Avenge which reach tens and thousands of people annually. Throughout the years, Science at Cal presents ongoing all free outreach programs in STEM and other disciplines and helps promote other groups related efforts on campus to create new programs and new initiatives at Berkeley and in the community. Our broad scope of activities make it possible for Science at Cal's campus. Um, all of our alliances and all of our community partnerships, which you can read a little bit here on the screen. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce the other half of this amazing collaboration, Berkeley Lab with Jen Tang. So take it, take it away, Jen. Thanks, Dee. Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Tang, and I am the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And for those who aren't familiar, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. We are supported by the Department of Energy's Office of Science, and we're also managed by the University of California. All of the research we conduct is unclassified. And since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we've been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Today, Berkeley's lab, Berkeley Lab's employees work together to develop meaningful scientific solutions to the world's most intractable energy and environmental challenges. They help train the next generation of scientists and engineers. And we like to ensure that those things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. 
Now, our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills, and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. And many of the lab's researchers are actually affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, as postdocs, or professors who have a joint appointment at the lab. And we're especially fortunate to have a close relationship with UC Berkeley, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. One of the main motivations, as folks might know by now, uh, for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary research from both of our institutions. So we hope you enjoy today's presentation on how CRISPR can help tackle climate change. Uh, Dee, let me hand things back over to you. Sure, thank you, Jen. And I am going to introduce our first speaker who is Nicholas Caravolius. He is a fifth year PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in plant biology. Nicholas's research focuses on the developmental genetics of rice stomata, making use of CRISPR-Cas9 as well as other genetic tools. He seeks to understand how stomata develop in rice, and using this knowledge, he think, he then seeks to generate rice varieties that are better adapted to drought, which we'll learn all about today. Nicholas also studies how gene editing can be applied broadly in agriculture to address climate change. So a perfect first speaker for us today. Welcome, Nicholas, and go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Dee, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here today. I'm super excited to share a little bit about my research, uh, which, as Dee mentioned, is really focused on how we can use gene editing in agriculture for climate change. So in this presentation, I hope to help you understand broadly how that's been done to date, and then some of my own work in uh, trying to establish a better understanding of stomata and rice. And if you're not sure what stomata are or what this on the right is, stay tuned. You're going to find out. So climate change, right? It's a, it's a word we hear a lot. It's a big concern to us. And I specifically wanted us to think about how climate change will impact our food systems. So uh, through years of studying climate change, we've come to understand certain environmental outcomes of this process. Uh, things like erratic rainfall, increased flooding, um, increased temperatures, and the aspect of climate change that I'm really focused on is increased uh, droughts. And so there are a lot of negative environmental outcomes that will manifest also negatively in agricultural systems. So we anticipate as a result of climate change that we'll have increased disease severity, we'll have lower yields of our crops and livestock, and we'll also have lower nutritive quality. So collectively, Climate change stands to impose and is imposing really severe negative pressure on our agricultural systems. And with that really rosy description, uh, we actually have a lot of opportunities for and hopeful reasons for how gene editing specifically can help us address climate change in agriculture. So before I get into some of those examples, I actually want to help walk us through what is CRISPR? This is a word we hear a lot, you know, and it uh, has become almost a household term, but it actually is really incredible how it works. So CRISPR-Cas is a gene editing system that was first developed here at Berkeley, Go Bears, and it works by using a nuclease. In this case, we're calling it Cas9. Now these are molecular scissors that can go and make double-stranded breaks in the DNA. Now this, enzyme, the Cas9, can be guided to a specific region in our genes of interest using a guide RNA. And that guide RNA is highly pro programmable. We're able to use that guide to make the precise edits in genes that we're interested in studying. So in my case, I'll use them to study rice stomata, but researchers in a variety of organisms can use CRISPR-Cas to make double-stranded breaks in a very programmed way. Now, these double-stranded breaks cause uh, the cell to require a repair system to come into play. And through the process of this repair, we can have many different outcomes. Now, it's not important that you understand what all these words mean on the screen on the right, but just know that the process of repairing DNA uh, can introduce changes to the DNA that are desirable for researchers 
who want to study how genes work and also make improvements in things like crops and livestock for climate change resilience. So what this means for agriculture is a range of incredible features and traits that have been improved through the application of gene editing. And so the, the four traits that most of the gene edits have converged on in agriculture for climate change have included disease tolerance, improved yields, Improving yields also means that we have to, we don't require as much land for agriculture, which is a doubly benefit. We have drought and salt tolerance, and finally nutritional improvement. And as you remember, these were some of the ways that agriculture stood to be really negatively affected by climate change. And so it's really exciting to see that gene editing applications have converged on these traits. And they've converged on these traits quite recently. In fact, you can see here the number of new discoveries or innovations that have occurred in crops and livestock um, in the recent years. And you'll see in 2018, we had a huge year for an increase in gene editing discoveries. And it's no coincidence that this almost coincides with the first published CRISPR-Cas9 editing publications. And so in animal and plant cells, the use of this gene editing tool was demonstrated in 2013, and we got our first fully regenerated plants in 2015. So it really stands to show that CRISPR-Cas9 has been fundamental in shaping this movement. This recent surge of discoveries that we observe are really associated with the uh, application of CRISPR-Cas9 to crop and livestock organisms. So recently, it's been a very exciting time to be in the field. Um, not just for the number of innovations, but for the range of organisms that these discoveries have affected. And so you can see here on the left is crops and on the right is livestock, just the diversity of organisms that have been edited for some climate change phenotype or trait um, demonstrated. And so this list just keeps on growing and it's really exciting to see the beautiful diversity of crops and livestock that we have the ability to make gene edits in and that have already been gene edited for some type of aspect that will make um, them more resilient to climate change. And so um, honing in on some of these specific examples, I wanted to share with you some of the examples or uh, demonstrations of gene editing in agriculture that I find most exciting. So you, let's start on the top left here. You'll see in this orange box, these are all examples of gene edited organisms for a yield improvement, increasing either the biomass of the livestock or the uh, size of fruit in the case of tomato. So you'll see here, this is red sea bream. The left is an edited version and the right is an unedited or wild type version. And there's a stark visible difference. That fish on the left is, the, is much larger. And the same can be said of that cow on the bottom. So collectively, these livestock through the same edit of the same gene in different organisms yielded really massive improvements in yield. Um, and we also can observe yield improvements in tomato, where through gene editing, we get much larger fruit. Moving over to this blue region, these are nutritional quality improvements facilitated by gene editing. So we have an example of a banana here, and you can see that banana on the right is, has a much darker yellow color. That's because it's accumulating beta carotene or the precursor to vitamin A. Through a single gene edit, we're able to make healthier bananas. In the case of this chicken, well, we can have reduced fat accumulation, which is typically considered a byproduct in, ch in chickens and make our chickens both more nutritious and we get more uh, meat for, instead of fat for the amount of input of calories. In red here, you see an example, this is uh, salt tolerance and rice. And so the plants on the right look a lot healthier and that's because they've been edited for a region or a gene that uh, improves salt tolerance. And so these plants are growing in a salty solution and the unedited or wild type plant is doing much worse than the plants that have been edited. In green, you see examples for disease tolerance. So these piggies here, they are gene edited for re uh, resistance to a porcine respiratory virus. And the pigs that you don't see 
uh, the wild type pigs actually got so severely ill that they needed to be euthanized. And so gene editing in this case is able to really advance our ability to provide protection from diseases. And the same can be said of this rice here that's being field trialed. Uh, on the left is that wild type, on the right is that edited version. You can see just a really stark difference between these plants as a result of the edit that facilitated increased disease tolerance. And so there's been a beautiful diversity of gene edits and a, a wide array of organisms that have facilitated improvements for climate related traits. Um, and I seek to do something similar in my own work by studying what I described earlier, stomata. So stomata are the major sites of water loss, but they're also required for photosynthesis. And if we look at a rice leaf, we'll see um, on the top and the bottom, the distribution of stomata everywhere. And if we zoom in on one of these stomata, they look like this. Um, and they're like little mouths, actually come from the Greek word for mouth. And they're the sites where carbon dioxide enters for photosynthesis and um, water vapor exits. And so we have to balance these two really important processes, both taking in carbon for photosynthesis, but also managing water loss. Now you'll recall, we mentioned that increased droughts are expected as a result of climate change, erratic rainfall. So if we can generate crops, rice specifically, that requires a lot of water, that doesn't necessarily require so much water, we might be able to adapt to climate change. So I liken myself to something of a rice Goldilocks. That's me up top and I'm searching for that fine tuned stomata density, a rice line that has the perfect number of stomata such that they can optimize the trade off between taking in carbon dioxide and releasing and uh, not releasing too much water. And so what this looks like is using CRISPR Cas9 to edit target genes in the rice uh, in rice DNA, and these target genes are regulators of stomatal development. And so after editing these genes, I look at properties of the plants like stomatal density or gas exchange, th uh, thermal regulation, which is how the plants manage their temperature and water conservation. So getting a little bit into the data, um, you'll see through editing these regulators or these target genes in, in stomatal development and rice, we're able to create differences in stomatal density. So that pink column on the right is wild type. That's what you should compare everything to. It's the unedited version. And you'll see that gr the green and yellow are both edited forms um, of these rice plants that have reduced stomatal density. That edit in stomagen or that yellow line is really tremendously reduced in stomatal density, whereas an edit in EPFL10, that green line, has moderate reductions in stomatal density. So after having this cool phenotype, we were curious about uh, what this would mean for other properties of the plant. And so then we looked at gas exchange, which is a broadly a way of understanding how much uh, CO2 is entering and how much water vapor is exiting. And what we find is in really tremendous reductions of stomatal density in those yellow lines, we also have reductions in gas exchange. Whereas in EPFL10, that moderately reduced line, you can't really tell it apart from that unedited one. And that's true at a single light intensity and across a range of light intensities. We also wanted to look at properties like thermoregulation or that plant or the temperature management. And what we find is that the lines with very, very few stomata, well, they get warmer actually. And the lines that have moderate reductions, you can't tell apart from wild type. Really excitingly, we do see that both tremendous reductions in stomatal density and moderate reductions in stomatal density actually facilitate water saving. So there's less cumulative water loss in those lines that have been edited when we compare to wild type. And so this is a demonstration of a really exciting way that we can use gene editing to help uh, rice plants or other plants facilitate improved uh, resistance to drought. So just to sum up here, um, I wanna remind you all that gene editing is a really powerful mechanism to address climate change in agriculture. And through the application of gene editing, we've seen recent advancements in a huge diversity of organisms. And again, these are really recent discoveries. 
And in my case, we can edit genes that regulate stomatal development to generate rice varieties that can be resistant to climate change. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was great. And we already have at least 10 questions for you. So we know this is going to be <laughs> a question filled at Midday Science Cafe. Um, so I have this, I thought this was a funny one. Why, what makes tomatoes so popular for gene editing? Because we've been editing tomatoes for a long time, right? That's true. <laughs> so I know there's probably some gene editors in the audience, but my understanding is that there's a really good genome for tomatoes. It's easy to study gene editing when we have a lot of resources. So there are processes like tissue culture and genome assemblies that exist in tomato that make them easier to study than let's say wheat, which is a really complex one to a gene edit because of how complicated its genome is. So I think tomato is a nice model for that reason. Ah. Uh. Okay, so that makes sense. It wasn't, we just didn't like, oh, tomato, that seems like the good People one. People also love yeah. tomatoes. It's yeah, they do. It's important crop. <laughs> the juicier and the flavorful, the better, right? Definitely. So how do you, oh wait, I, how are the, uh, are there any other gene edited foods that we can buy in the grocery store using the technology that you described today? Yeah, so in the United States, not yet, but really soon. Um, there are some soybeans that are on the horizon that have a different fatty acid profile to make them healthier. There's a company called Pearwise that is making a delicious and nutritious salad green through gene editing. That's coming to your shelves soon, hopefully. In Japan, really excitingly, they approved some gene edited products. So again, the tomato, uh, there's a GABA uh, tomato. It ha has high levels of GABA, which is a, a, a purportedly good for your brain health. So there's lots of things on the horizon. Excellent. It's it's funny that we're talking about tomatoes too, because Science of Cal has an entire lecture just on tomatoes. So we should put that in the chat, at least if we can find that for folks. Um, the next question I think is, is one that refers to your plot. So um, you know how you had the discoveries in 2019 to 2020, it seemed to go down. Do you have an idea for why the, the discovery amount went down in 2020? Oh, maybe the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you stole my punchline. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, the pandemic really affected uh, science research. I don't know why the, the reduction happened from 2018 to 2019, but we can almost directly attribute what we see in 2020 to the pandemic. Hmm, interesting. I wonder what the results of kind of loss in discoveries across sciences because of the pandemic. That's a really interesting question. Okay, well, we're going to um, ponder that a little bit more, but we're going to hand things over to Jen and Berkeley Lab now. So thanks, Nicholas, so much. Again, wonderful. And we'll have more questions for Nicholas after we hear from Thomas. Thanks so much. You guys are making me hungry. I want like a tomato sandwich for lunch. <laughs> Anyway, thanks, Dee and Nicholas. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Thomas Eng. So Thomas is broadly interested in understanding the differences and similarities across microbes to better engineer them for applications in biotechnology. Thomas received his undergraduate degree from MIT and conducted his graduate studies at UC Berkeley. So I'll say it again, go Bears. And he is now <laughs> affiliated with Berkeley Lab and the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And that is where Thomas uses CRISPR tools to domesticate all kinds of microbes. Uh, so in his spare time, when he's not in the lab, Thomas enjoys spending time with his two cats who maybe if we're lucky, might make a cameo during this Midday Science Cafe session. <laughs> Awesome. Thomas, let me hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Jen, for that very kind introduction. And I'm hoping for absolutely no hiccups today as I hit the share button on my screen. And I'm hoping that everyone is able to hear me. I need to move this chat out of the way. And great. So, so far, so good. Looks my, great. Uh, slides are perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks again for that very kind introduction. As you guys know, my name is Thomas Eng. I'm affiliated with Florence Berkeley National Labs and the Joint Bioenergy Institute. I'll click. Now, uh, we heard from Nick earlier uh, in the previous talk about how we're using CRISPR to uh, really help uh, advance our 
productivity in agriculture. But an agriculture is a major contributor to climate change. And, and the other side of the climate change equation is, is our use and dependence on oil for many facets of our life. And while we may think of using oil when you go to the gas station to fill up that gas tank, oil has been used and is part of our daily life, and it has been for a really, really long time. On the left and right hand side of my slide here, I'm showing you two old timey ads. One is for this new heralding inve invention of using petroleum derived products in your new toothbrush heads. These are the new way, the miracle way of improving your hygiene by, by a gift of petroleum. And on, on the other side, you can see this wonderful ad talking about cracking the code for new applications in lipstick. And even beyond, these ideas of and, and use cases, um, this wonderful lobbying group in the center has put out this, this glossy de demonstration of, of what are all the great uses for petroleum. And from this one barrel of, of crude oil, you can get many things, not just uh, personal hygiene and care products in addition to filling your desk tank. But if you today are wearing a cotton poly blend shirt or just a standard polyester t-shirt, well, you have literally wrapped yourself in a crude oil derived product. And so just to reiterate, Crude oil and petroleum derived products, they are everywhere. They are ubiquitous in our personal lives. And at the Joint Bioenergy Institute, our mission is to build the technologies that will enable the replacement of, of these petroleum derived products uh, for the production of gasoline, diesel, jet fuels, and, and the other common day, everyday things that, that we think about. And what we envision a radical process to make this happen. We will use renewable carbon streams, such as from plants, not necessarily corn or sugarcane, which we eat, but, but weedy plants. And we will find new ways of breaking these plants apart to pull out the sugars, the sugars and other things that we can feed to microbes. And if we can feed these microbes, these renewable carbon streams, we can also engineer these, these microbes and coax out ways of making them produce any molecule you might imagine. Jay Kiesling, our founder, came up with this idea in 2007 because he had figured out a way of producing an anti-malarial drug, a, a precursor to that drug. And, and with that technology, we said, well, can we produce, what else can we produce? Can we produce molecules like this antiviral? Biofuels aren't that far off. And from that idea, the Joint Bioenergy Institute was born. Now, I talked a little bit about crude oil, and I told you that crude oil was everywhere, and we, we use a lot of it. Well, what does that mean? What, what, how is specific? How much crude oil do we really use? And many of you don't have a, a, a drum of oil at your workplace that you can look at. And to, for comparison, uh, I want you to think of a bathtub. This isn't my bathtub. This is a stock image of a bathtub. But if you were to fill that bathtub to the brim, that would be about 42 gallons of water. And that is roughly the amount of liquid you would find in one barrel of crude oil, 40, 42 gallons. We as a country use 20 million barrels of oil. And uh, just to illustrate, I'm showing you a photo of a refinery in Richmond, uh, near and dear to our Bay Area, uh, just you know, blowing out that, 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 the, that exhaust in, into the environment. And on the other side, I'm showing you a picture of an oil tanker supporting the international oil trade. And so it is, it is not just a, um, a, it's no small feat to say that yes, our reliance on oil is a major contributor to climate change. It's, it's uh, 20 million barrels a year. And not just through the lens of climate change is our dependence on oil bad, but as we've seen during the pandemic, oil derived products, when we have shortages because these supply chains are disrupted, it can have wide ranging effects in, in every aspect of our, of our daily life. Now, to remove our dependence on oil, there are already companies in the emerging bioeconomy which have been able to demonstrate one or two or three or four types of molecules that you can produce at scale. The title of my slide here is, how do you grow 20 million barrels of, of anything? It's an, it's an incomparable number. And this is a photo of a production facility of a company called Amaris. They're headquartered in Emeryville. And this is their facility in South America. And you've got a person here down at the bottom for, 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 for scale. And she, uh, they're standing next to several of their, loud, their, their large reactors. This is an 80 gallon reactor on one side and a 52,000 gallon reactor on the other. And they've got about six of those very large reactors. Now, getting a process and putting it using a microbe to, to convert a sugar into any molecule is a real investment in both time and money. The most 
celebrated and lauded uh, achievement was from DuPont. And this was an idea born in 1994 where they decided to try and convert sugars from corn into a plastic precursor, 1,3-propane dial. You, you don't need to know that name. But it could be used in many processes, and it might be possible for them to make it with microbes cheaper than they could design or extract from commodity, from, from crude oil. And so this is just a dramatization of what the time frame looked like, starting in 1994 with the birth of this idea. And it's fruition in 2006, where every step of the way over the course of these, of these 12 years, the researchers and engineers encountered smaller and bigger problems, right? ranging from, well, this microbe we want to use to, to do this, this process, it's, it's not growing, to, oh, the, the product that we're, we're getting out, the, the concentration, it's, it's simply too low, to, oh, we've, we've moved the process to the pilot plant and everything broke. We have no idea what's going on until finally you're able to flip the switch and get it started after the cost of $1 billion. That's the estimated cost of how much it takes uh, to move one idea to a pilot plant. It's another crazy number. So what I've shown you before was this image of a, of a reaction. How would you turn corn and, and sugar into a final product. Well, when you're working with a cell, this sort of reaction is very simplistic. Cells are catalysts for, for, move, for, for changing one product into another product, but it happens in the context of all these competing reactions in the same cell. And this descriptor of a cell and its central metabolism can be overwhelming to look at in, in some of these diagrams, but here, uh, I have a wonderful image from Washington University where they've described cellular metabolism as a map where you are getting able to transit from one area to another. And that's a better representation of how we can think about when you feed a cell glucose or dextrose and what it could be converted into. And that's, that's the analogy that I'm, I'm going to work with for a few minutes. So please, please bear with me. So if we think of cellular metabolism as a map. Here's a standard map that you might think from, from Google as we're looking, uh, we're trying to think of a way of how to get from UC Berkeley to another place. If you were a driver, you might do is you might open up your phone and, and, and say, oh, Google says right now, getting to the Oakley airport, super easy, I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take 80, It'll, I'll be there in, in you know, no time at all. We are not the driver in this scenario. When we're trying to engineer a microbe to do something, you are not the driver in the driver's seat. The microbe is the driver in the driver's seat. And unfortunately for us, microbes love detours. They don't behave the way that we would want them to, the way that we would anthropomorphize that, would, what, that, they're, that they should behave. The, the, the microbe looks at the potential routes to get from UC Berkeley to the Oakland International Airport and they say, oh, well, you know, sure, I, I see that that traffic is predicted to be on the, uh, on the highway, but uh, maybe I'll take another route. It's, it's not that bad. Or maybe, um, maybe I want to take BART today. Or actually, maybe I just want to get my steps in and I'm going to walk because that, that's what I want. We're using CRISPR because it is a great way for us to domesticate the microbe. And the way that we do this is that we use CRISPR to put roadblocks. We block off every single possible detour that the cell might want to take and force it to take one specific route. We do this with CRISPR interference. Now, Nicholas told you about how you can use CRISPR as a pair of scissors to make double strand breaks in, in DNA. This is a method which is a, a play on that. It's, it's a little bit of a, of, a, more of a different way. Instead of using CRISPR to make breaks, we use CRISPR as a traffic officer. It is able to interrupt the ability of the cell to make the messages that are encoded from RNA. And by blocking its access to make those RNA molecules, we're able to totally block its ability to uh, produce the metabolic reactions that, it, that the cell would use as these detours. We express both Cas9 and specially designed RNA molecules. Those are the guide RNAs that Nicholas told you about. Those come from a plasmid. And when this Cas9 protein binds to its guide RNA, it uses that as a signal of where it should go. And with those information, the route is fully blocked. Our cells 
express 14 of these unique different of these guide RNAs. Um, and with those 14 marks, that was the highest record, well, it still is, the highest number of unique guide RNAs ever expressed in a single cell. So we take our analogy back of how CRISPR interference is used. And here's our, our metabolic map once more. And while the cell, without this rewiring, without the, the action of CRISPR, it's able to pick any path it wants. But with our CRISPR interference, we are successfully able to limit and reroute the cell. So it's only able to take the one preferred path. And that's what we're representing here with this bright red arrow going from flux into the cell of the, of the, of the feed of sugar and out into the final product that we, that we want, that we have decided. We demonstrated this work for a bioproduct, not, uh, not the, the jet fuel that we talked about earlier, but we needed to demonstrate that this technique could work on anything. And so we picked a renewable dye as an alternative to indigo. When you use indigo to dye clothes, such as blue jeans, not only do you have to use a large amount of water, but you use a lot of carcinogens in that dyeing process. And so indigo iodine, this alternative to indigo, is a really compelling target to think about when you want to demonstrate a new biologically uh, conversion method. Uh, the, on the left hand side, you can see an example of some indigo iodine we've produced in lab. And in the middle panel is our demonstration of the CRISPR technology being applied to a microbial process. On the uh, left hand side are our CRISPR engineered strains. You can see a more blue color compared to the right hand side. Those are labeled control. And when we scale this to stir tank reactors, these are the format that industry uses. So you think about those big plants of 62,000 liters. These are the same parameters that they're thinking about. And we're able to demonstrate that the rewiring that we have used on the lab scale, it still holds under the simulated industrial conditions. Looking forward, there's a lot of interesting routes that we can take. We were the first to demonstrate that this technique was even feasible. We used a new microbe, we used a new target, we used the new techniques, but there's always, there's always room for improvement. The metaphor I gave you was that uh, we had put up roadblocks, that CRISPR was being used to, to say, oh, this road is, this, this error per is detoured, you, you shouldn't come here. But we can also use CRISPR uh, in the way uh, similar to what Nicholas talked about is uh, to physically remove those ropes and pull them out completely. Because you always know people don't always obey detour signs. And in the same way, can we make the cells uh, more compliant with the things that we're asking them? And while we have shown you this process works for a renewable dye, we're currently working on applying our same strategies to produce jet fuels with the same uh, uh, properties. The microbe that we talked about was fed glucose, but when you extract plants, you get a lot more out from there. And so can we really demonstrate that this process works with a large stream of, of feeds that we can use? So those are just a few ideas that we're moving forward with. And uh, I'd love to thank everyone in, in our group who worked on this wonderful project. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. That was a really fantastic presentation, Thomas. Thanks, um, Jen. So, the, yeah, the questions are coming in hard and fast. So, I'm going to ask you a couple about your research, and then we'll bring uh, Nicholas and Dee back up to the to the stage with us. So, um, you know, obviously, fossil fuels have got to go. How fast can the processes you're working on be implemented? Like, are we going to be seeing any of these fuels um, in in the near future? I'd love to say yes, you know, we've really are looking forward to bringing these processes online, but the Joint Bioenergy Institute, our processes are not designed so that you can use them today. We're, we're really envisioning an economy of tomorrow. Currently, uh, no one is producing biofuels, bioethanol, using renewable carbon streams we're talking about. The processes today still use corn and sugarcane for the most part. And so I'd love to, we, one of the big things that we're doing at JBA is we're lo we love to bring in industrial partners and say, hey, what part of these processes can you start thinking about? Can we, can we get you to start thinking about using renewable carbon streams? Do you want to use the microbes that we're using? Do you want to use the, breaking, the breakdown technologies that we're using? And so the, our uh, federal government is very invested in bringing these technologies on, online. 
But I'd say that these are really long-term strategies so far. And I, I think continued investment from the federal government will help speed those processes along. Got it, thanks. And so, you know, speaking of corn, growing corn right now does require a lot of fossil fuels, you know, in the form of pesticides, maybe fuel for the tractors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that considered when evaluating the, the footprint of, of these options? Absolutely, absolutely. So a component I didn't have any time to talk about are something called life cycle analysis and techno-economic analysis. And when you think about the feedstocks that you use for a process, you have to envision, okay, well, what is the cost of growing the crops in terms of energy to uh, run the reactors? If there's fertilizer applied, usually you don't want to apply any fertilizer for the best analysis. How far do you have to transport the materials? How much effort do you have to put in to extract the final product? and what is the market sale price of these things. They're very complicated analysis and they really allow us to say, where's, where are the, the sensitivities for a process like this? How do we make a process that we've developed competitive with the existing market products? Got it, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Uh, well, I think we're gonna get to the questions that we've got in the chat and the Q&A. So I'll ask you to stop sharing your screen you stay right here. And I am going to invite Nicholas and Dee to join us. Hello and hello. hello. All right. <laughs> well, both of you really, really compelling and fascinating uh, presentations. Um, so we, we've got a ton of questions um, in the chat and I'm trying to think of a good question for us to start with. Dee, I don't know if you've got one at the top of your list, um, but- yeah. Yes. I'll start with sort of there's a, a grouping of questions around sort of the understanding of with the difference between CRISPR gene editing and GMO, or are they all lumped together? So could we start there? Um, what's the difference between CRISPR gene editing and GMO, or are, does GMO encompass CRISPR gene editing? Yeah, I can take that question if it's all right. I love to keep these things separate. <laughs> So GMOs have gotten a terrible rep and we don't want to mix gene editing into that. So you learned a little bit about gene editing today. We can use guides to make precise edits in specific genes of interest, right? Um, GMOs function by a really different mechanism. And so uh, I'll give you an example of a GMO that's the most widely used and that's BT corn. So BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis and that's a soil bacterium that has a gene uh, that encodes for uh, insecticide resistance. So we move the gene from the soil bacterium into corn, and now that corn plant uh, can resist these insects, lepidoptera and insects that really are harmful to the well being of that corn. So that's an example of a transgene, right? We move a gene from one organism that's incompatible with, wouldn't ever cross pollinate, let's say, or that gene would never end up in corn by itself and we moved it to give it a desirable property. That's a GMO. In my case, you know, the rice lines that I developed just have a small little modification in the DNA. Um, so it's entirely native DNA, no new gene was introduced. And <clears throat> from a regulatory perspective, these things are wildly different. And so gene editing policy for agriculture is really emerging, but what we're seeing is uh, many nations are making the decision to say, if you have a gene edit, a small mutation, you actually don't have to go through a stringent regulatory process like we would for GMOs. And so scientifically and from a kind of a political perspective, they're quite different. Thank you so much. Thomas, do you want to chime in with anything else or do you feel like he he got it? <laughs> oh, it's it's a great answer. You know, it's, okay. it's a, if you think about agriculture, the only thing that hasn't been, even if you, if your plants have, uh, farmers have been modifying plants slowly for thousands of years, you could say that the only thing that hasn't been modified is the avocado, which we, we still just have not modified at all. But beyond that, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question to think about. Oh, I love that little piece of trivia you gave us there, Thomas, too. I didn't know that. <laughs> so there's, of course, there's controversy and fears and uh, about unintended consequences of GMOs. Um, does your understanding, both of you kind of, do you feel as though that those fears don't need to be, no aspects of that needs to be concerned in this space as well? Or do you think that those fears 
um, and misunderstandings um, are misplaced as it relates to GMO as well. So I'm definitely not in a position to tell anybody what they're allowed to be fearful of. And it's rightfully so, you know, this is a, eating is one of the most intimate processes. We do it hopefully three times a day. It's something cultural, spiritual. So if people are fearful around technology, uh, it's justified, you know, because food is sacred. Um, that being said, from a scientific perspective, I don't think that gene editing imposes any type of new risk or anything that's worth being fear, feel for, fearful of from a bio, biological perspective. Um, these products still have a regulatory process associated with them, right? And so it's not like they're just gonna willy nilly end up on your dinner plates. And so I think the fear is justified, but as is from a scientific perspective, I'm not concerned about any of the causes of gene editing. Wonderful, thank you. Jen, there are a few more questions around this type. So I'm just gonna keep getting through those so that we can get to the other ones. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, fine. so as with um, GMOs, does anyone own the rights to these gene edits? I think that's a really interesting question. Right, so this takes us back to regulation. So the regulation associated with GMOs is very expensive and very time consuming, such that very few players can actually participate in commercializing GMOs. And we've seen that accumulation of power with specific companies. I think somebody in the, set, in the chat said the M word, I'm not gonna repeat it. Um, as it happens, gene editing, because the regulatory landscape is so different, it's allowing more people to participate, right? And so we see that um, universities, we see that uh, nonprofits are able to actually think about commercializing this technology. Um, and it's really an exciting time to be a researcher in this space because we can imagine that some of the products we're generating will make it to the field one day. And I'm actually really so excited that I have an upcoming field trial with Colombian collaborators and they are, so should that edit work, we actually have the capacity to bring this to farmers' hands, you know? And so this is absolutely shifting the paradigm of how we do biological research, but also think about translating products to farmers. And those farmers would still own those crops. It's not like UC Berkeley owns that then. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So the deregulation and the IP can get a little complicated. We can't pick, tease it all apart, but the way that a variety is protected currently would also apply to gene edited products. Woo, we got a lot of those questions out of the way. I think that that was needed. Um, there's a little bit of questions that are kind of, you know, on, on the edge of those, but we'll go ahead and open it up to some more questions. Jen, go ahead. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, Thomas, we've got a couple of specific questions for you. Um, and so, so the difference between synthetic and natural carbon-based fuels is that the synthetic fuels use carbon extracted from the atmosphere now rather than millions of years ago. So uh, there is, is there or is there not a net increase in atmospheric carbon? The process of burning the fuel will always release carbon dioxide. So it, it really is understanding where will you draw the line. If it's that you're fine saying, okay, we are going to take carbon dioxide in from the air, and we're going to use that through a process, and we're going to account for all the electricity we need to run our reactors, yeah, that's fine. But carbon neutral burning of biofuels is just simply not possible. But beyond that, it is possible to fully say we're going to produce more biofuel using carbon dioxide. And, and with those metrics, it is possible. Just that, remember, burning something will release carbon dioxide. Got it. Thank you. Uh, another fuel question for you. So cellulosic ethanol production has been, you know, a pretty big disappointment, despite, you know, some of the, uh, the, the mandates we saw from the federal government and investment of, of lots of money. Can CRISPR turn this, you know, failure into a success? We don't look at corn. We are looking beyond corn at Berkeley Labs, uh, beyond making blend stocks of ethanol, cellulosic ethanol. We have emerging candidates which can go in airplanes, where have much higher energy density for, for jet fuels. And so 
I think if we can have a successful synthetic biology jet fuel, that'll be a very nice win. Awesome, that sounds great. So let me ask a question for, for both of you. Um, you know, as CRISPR is mostly able to modify relatively short stretches of DNA and the other methods of introducing longer DNA sequences or genes into the cells aren't able to specifically target a DNA integration site, can Cas9 or other similar proteins be used with a modified method to insert large DNA sequences with the same specificity as CRISPR editing? Yeah, I can tackle that first. So if you think back to that early like slide that I shared, the CRISPR 101, right? How gene editing works. So we can program these nucleases, these enzymes like Cas9 to go make double-stranded breaks. And then there are a variety of repair outcomes that can happen. So one of them will introduce a couple mutations and maybe removes the bridge like Thomas described. But we also can leverage a repair mechanism called uh, homology directed repair, which is a mouthful, but basically you can insert a gene of interest or a stretch of DNA that you're interested in studying to a precise location using an, a native cellular repair mechanism. And so it's, it's not always the case that uh, gene editing or CRISPR-Cas9 will only introduce small mutations. You can also use this other pathway um, and not to get too in the weeds, but there are lots of different ways that we can uh, gene edit. So there's something called prime editing, and that will let us make slightly larger mutations. So um, I think there is a lot of opportunity with the CRISPR-Cas system to generate a variety of types of outcomes in the DNA. Got it. Um, Thomas, any, anything you want to add there? Oh, that was a beautiful answer. I don't want to get too much in the weeds with, you know, homology directed repair versus non homologous end joining. So I, I think we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave Nicholas's answer as, as okay. it. That sounds good. And, you know, speaking of Cas9, how are the Cas9 protein and guide RNA introduced into the cell? Oh, and I'm looking in the chat. For I think uh, it's sure. a little different yeah. for plants and microbes. I, oh, I, I, I can go first. Uh, we use a technique called uh, transformation, which allows us to use a little bit of electricity and it, it shocks the cells. And that process of electrically shocking the cells, somehow, we don't really understand this, enables them to take up bits of circular DNA. And that circular DNA encodes both the Cas protein and the guide RNA. Nicholas, it might be a little different for some of your uh, oh, agrobacteria. Yeah, definitely different. Um, <laughs> we're not so lucky. We can't just electrocute plants and get some uh, <laughs> DNA into them, but uh, we can use a couple different methods. So one of them is called biolistics, and it or it used to be called the gene gun. And we literally used to shoot DNA particles at uh, plant tissue coated in gold, and that would enter the cell. Um, we've got rid of the gun part, but now it looks like a little chamber. That's one mechanism. But I think the most widely used mechanism is called agrobacteria mediated transformation. So there's this naturally existing bacteria that infects plants and actually is able to transfer some of its own genetic material into plant tissues. And researchers were, discovered that and leveraged that natural process to insert the genes that we were interested in studying. And so a sign of an agrobacterium infection in plants is like a tumor. You literally see like a massive cell growth and you can see it on trees. So that's some homework for you. Take a walk around and see if you can notice any agrobacterium infection. Well, whoever asked that question, I'm glad you did because that was a question I had as well. And those answers were, were fascinating. <laughs> Thanks both. Uh, let me turn things over to Dee. She'll ask some more questions. Yeah, and that actually goes into a good question um, that was written about how do you even pick the targeted genes, Nicholas? Um, so what's, you know, what specific change to the targeted genes is accomplished when you're using CRISPR? Um, is the gene being inactivated? So can you kind of just talk a little bit about the targeted gene? Right. So picking targets, I think, is the really fun part because there's lots of ways to do it and all of them are valid. So I can tell you a little bit about how I picked the genes that I studied. So the gene that I studied was studied in another plant, Arabidopsis, that's really easy 
much easier to study and they found this gene stomagen that had involvement in this process. And then I was curious about if they would have the same role in rice. So I used information from other organisms to study my gene in rice. And then it also happened that there are two copies of stomagen. So sometimes you get genes that look a lot like each other but have different roles. And so I studied that second gene in rice also. So that was kind of based on previous information. People can also do really unbiased ways of picking genes. They say uh, they, can, they have lots of ways of picking genes that maybe don't come from previous information. And so I think selecting targets um, is a fun part of what we get to do as researchers. And then you get to figure out many years later if it has anything to do with the trait you're interested in. Um, Right now we're focusing on picking genes, or my focus is on picking genes who when you remove the function of them, when you knock that bridge out, you have some benefit, you know, but you can also imagine that you could pick genes that you might want to amplify the performance of or increase the amount of. Uh, so depending on what your trait is and what the outcome of your edit is, you can select genes. Very cool. Have you, um, and this might be somebody in the field asking this question about bryophytes. Is that familiar to you? Yeah. <laughs> so, did you look at the genes in the bryophytes and, and how they can survive droughts? Yeah, so bryophytes have really different types of stomata than uh, rice or grasses or most crop species. So the stomata information that you get from bryophytes isn't super helpful, but it's a great question. And I think you're getting at a really amazing way that we do plant biology, which is com by comparing, you know, these organisms do really well under drought. What, what do they have going on? And I think one example that I love is the resurrection plant. This is a plant that can, it looks like just like a dried out mangled mess. You know, it looks like it's been dead for decades. And then if you add water, it comes back to life. It's really beautiful. It can handle really, really low water content. And I think uh, there's a group of researchers that are dedicated to studying how does it do that? Um, because it's interesting one, but also if we could understand that process in that organism, maybe we could transfer some of those mechanisms into a plant like rice. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in bryophytes to think about them really hard because there's a lot that we can learn from them. We Wasn't have a, a case. Well, oh, go ahead, Thomas. I, I, I remember there was a case of someone resurrected one of these bryophytes from, from ancient Israel. It was like 4,000 years old. They got four of them to germinate. It was a very high, high profile paper a bunch of years ago. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Another piece of trivia, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of trivia. Need to bring you along. <laughs> Jeopardy. Go one day. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I will mention that we also have a, a talk that's in Spanish on doing just that with liverwort. So maybe we can, if any Spanish speakers are um, in the audience, we can send along that uh, that link as well um, about kind of reviving the research around liver liverworts. Warts, excuse me. Um, okay, so another question for you, Nicholas, around sort of testing to see if that stomatal reduction actually changes the nutritional value of rice. Have you guys looked into that? So we have some field trials coming up, which will actually give us the harvest that would require to uh, be able to test. I think people are really always very concerned with nutrition, rightfully so, because that's the product, you know? And there, we have good systems in place for being able to study nutrition, but also what's really exciting about using CRISPR is that we're modifying the expression or removing the function of a gene, you know? So if you think about the plan as a collection of proteins, you just remove one thing from the collection, doesn't necessarily fundamentally shift what, what is rice, you know? We're not redefining what rice is or that consumed product. We're just removing one thing from a collection of, and the beautiful array of proteins still remains. And so there's really good reason to believe that there should have, there should be no nutritional implications for the types of edits that we're making. Excellent, thank you. And I'll hand things over to Jen. Thank you so much. So Nicholas, it was interesting to hear how you selected the genes that you're working with. Thomas, I'm curious to know, you know, th there's gotta be like 
a million different microbes out there. What microbes did you use for the process you're working on and why did you pick it? Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't get uh, a chance to talk about it. It's just, it's a very, we, we thought of long and hard about this. So the reason we use the microbe called Pseudomonas petita, which is from the soil. Uh, it's not one that's traditionally worked on in industrial microbiology uh, because it's not as much as known about it. But the reason we picked it is that this microbe is able to consume, is able to eat more sources of carbon, more uh, things beyond just glucose um, and the more standard sort of sugars that are currently used. And with that sort of inherent capability, that's where we decided to do all of our engineering. Got it, fascinating. Um, and how, well, I'll save my questions since I know where you work and I can ask you later, I'm gonna ask some of these audience questions. Uh, and I did see somebody in the, in the chat say, let's get into the weeds. So I'm gonna ask you a bit of a technical question. Would you be able to edit microorganisms to solely produce bioplastics, and by that they mean PHA, uh, by expressing the gene responsible for the production of those plastics? And in the parentheses, they've written a word, which I'm not familiar with, but I'm guessing you will be. It's a P-H-A-C-A-B operon. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, Pseudomonas petita natively expresses those that exact operon, the PHA AZC-2D genes. So if you feed it uh, glycerol, it will natively accumulate grams and grams and grams of this plastic precursor. There is active research on this uh, in Germany at Aachen University already. We're not interested in the native products. We want to, we, we, we're dreaming of, you know, non-native products, things you have to do a little more engineering. Got it, got it. And um, actually, there is there is a shout out in the chat for you, Thomas. I'm going to say one of our listeners, Ron, said, thank you, Thomas, for describing the amazing work of your group. He is going to be attending an NIH NHGRI short course in genomics uh, for about 40 educators that are focused on grades 6 through 16 uh, next week, the first week of August. Actually, I guess that's two weeks from now. So um, that uh, that course is going to be focusing on CRISPR-Cas9, and he is interested to know if he could use your slides in that meeting. And maybe Absolutely. we Absolutely. Can... Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, Ron, if you're able to drop your contact information in the chat to the host and panelists, we'll make sure we can get you Thomas's slides. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to toggle back to a question to, to both of you. Are there any other scientific uses for CRISPR beyond genome editing? Oh my gosh, yeah, so <laughs> exciting. Um, I mean, recently we saw with the emergence of the pandemic, really requiring high throughput, cheap ways to test. You know, there were CRISPR applications for diagnostics of COVID. Um, there are ways that we can use CRISPR not to edit genes, but to edit RNA, you know? So I think, that, and we're only discovering new ways, new ways to apply this technology all the time. And so what we showed or what I showed is kind of like original classic CRISPR. Um, but we are finding new ways all the time to leverage this really incredible technology. Awesome. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, Thomas, anything you want to add? I think we're limited by our imagination. I, I'd love to see artists in the space think about, oh, well, how do I use CRISPR to make music, to, to, to paint? I, I think the right person can come along and use it. They just, it, it can happen. But yeah, CRISPR has so much potential in the science space. It's the, well, you can do anything already. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so we talked a little bit about the pandemic. Thomas, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned in your presentation that the US uses about 20 million barrels of oil a year. Do you know if that number changed at all during the pandemic? It went down to about 18 million barrels a year. So it, if you so if you look at the graph from one of our US agencies of, of how oil consumption is, it's basically a flat line, a very slow uptick over since the 70s. And then 20, 2021, it goes down just a little bit. That's just, you know, domestic car use in Germany. But no, the other petroleum derived product, we're, we're still, you know, trying to use as fast as we can. So tiny little blip and it's come right back. Got it. Got it. Um, so uh, a question just popped up in the chat. Somebody's looking for a recommendation for a good reference on gene editing that sort of hits at maybe like the advanced undergraduate level. I don't know if either of you have any recommendations for some, some foundational learning. Uh, Ed Gene, Nick, Nicholas? I have to think about that one. 
Okay, if you guys think about it, maybe we can drop those suggestions in the chat toward the end. Um, uh, let's see, let me go back to our list of questions. Uh, so um, this one I think is for you, Nicholas. Would controlling, I, I think the intake of your research and controlling the water release, would that not also affect the O2 being released to the environment? I think this person was interested in seeing whether this might have a negative effect on the environment from that aspect. Yeah, that's a great question and super astute observation, right? These pores are where O2 is also released and I really focused on CO2 going in and water coming out. Um, O2 is uh, produced in the process of photosynthesis and uh, will be released just because of uh, concentration gradients. So if it, it's accumulating in the, in the plant, there's a high concentration of O2 inside and it'll naturally diffuse out. So those concentration gradients will still exist. It might be that the difference between them gets a little bit higher because there are fewer sites, but ultimately that O2 is gonna still be released. And photo, as long as photosynthesis is occurring, O2 is gonna be getting produced and getting released to the environment. Um, there'll just be fewer sites for release. Got it, thank you. Adi, I'll hand things back over to you. Yeah, and there's a question that's similarly related that when you're reducing the number of stomata and rice, how do you make sure that the plant can still take in enough CO2 and photosynthesize efficiently? Um, you know, how do you find the perfect balance when you're doing that? That's a great question. And so I think my research began to answer some of those questions. You have really dramatic reductions, you have moderate reductions. What does this look like for gas exchange? In one case, we see, oh, really reducing stomata will reduce gas exchange. But moderate reductions, you see the same levels of gas exchange. And so we were curious about how does that happen? There are fewer sites. And so we looked at how the morphology of those stomata. So not only is it, are they the sites for gas exchange, but they can also modulate how open they are. So if the food is really delicious on the dinner tape, you might have like jaw dropped, shoveling as much as you can into your mouth. Whereas if it's uh, you're a little not so stoked about it, you might be a little bit shy or only opening your mouth a little stomata the same way. They'll open really wide to just how much uh, CO2 they require. And so what we actually found was um, our line had a, a larger pore area um, in both reduced lines. And so they were making adjustments to make sure that they could still get the same amount of carbon dioxide. Got it. And then somebody made a, a kind of observation that the reduction in water loss is pretty moderate between the gene edited and the not edited rice. So is that actually significantly going to address water shortage or just something that we're, you're aware of? Yeah, so that water conservation phenotype was over the course of a week in the greenhouse. And so what hmm. might look like just a few mils multiplied by hundreds of plants in the field is actually really sizable. And not only is it this water conservation phenotype, but we're excited to test these lines in natural drought conditions. So do they fare better in the field um, if there are natural types of drought? Um, can they perform better? And um, what's really heartening is that if we look at naturally bred lines, so not CRISPR lines, but just through conventional breeding, we see that uh, these drought adapted lines are actually reduced in stomata to the same extent that my lines that have been edited are. So there's good precedent for this being a, a direction that we wanna take for drought adaptation. Great. I think that that's a really important kind of thing to know that something that looks so insignificant can have huge implications, especially because we're producing so much rice. That's wonderful. I, I want to make sure we ask this question before I forgot. It just came to my mind because, you know, CRISPR um, is such a new technology. It's not like we all went through elementary school or high school learning about CRISPR specifically. This is something that kind of in college and as you guys were going through grad school, how did you even get to where you are today being kind of these experts in this space? What did you, what, what did you major in? Um, when did you get introduced to CRISPR? Kind of what what drove your career path? Because I know typically we have some young scientists in the audience um, and just want to make sure that we they have the tools, kind of the know-how, the background of what your what the two of you, how you guided your way through through your education. So maybe Thomas can go first. 
Sure. Uh, I remember Ginek et al. Uh, that's the paper that, that Nicholas uh, referenced. It was one of the first papers looking at CRISPR and, and how amazing it was. Um, before CRISPR, there, it was a sort of a holy grail of, of how would you be able to edit any gene locus anywhere in any organism? And there had been a lot of flash in the pans that didn't really, really turn out. There were tailins and other zinc finger nucleases. So it was for a long time, we were sort of cautious about it. But my background is that I studied genetics in uh, grad school and biology in college. So I've been a fan of recombination DNA repair for, for quite some time. And uh, using CRISPR has been a great thing. It's, uh, it's taking our old technology of how we knew homologous recombination would work. That's how we describe how cells repair uh, events after DNA breaks. And using that, using CRISPR than any other micro. I don't know if I've really answered your question, but, but basically I've been doing biology for a long time. Wonderful. I have a little bit of a different journey. So my background is actually in agriculture. I was really inspired by food systems. I was really inspired by how biology can interact with society in this really specific way. Uh, so I studied agriculture. I studied everything from soil health to plant diseases to agribusiness and farm management. I've worked on farms. I used to work directly with growers uh, in like a kind of like an extension way. So supporting growers in their production. Um, and I got to dabble in rice breeding, so conventional breeding program, and was really excited about that because it felt really direct to consumers. Um, and it was impossible to be a biologist and not hear about CRISPR, I feel, because it really was, it felt so exciting to us. And so when I made the decision to come to graduate school, I knew that I wanted to be at the home of the innovation because I was excited about varieties, advanced breeding, supporting agriculture. And I just felt like this was going to be a new tool and a really exciting mechanism to get there. So I think for the people who are thinking about their careers, just the advice that I can give is be passionate about what you study and you'll notice what you think is going to be exciting. There's so many worthwhile things to study um, and it doesn't have to be CRISPR, but as long as you're passionate about it, I think you will have a at least fulfilling day to day. Great advice for life. Thank you, Nicholas and Thomas, for those answers. Uh, the questions are, are continuing to roll in. So we've got a few more. Thomas, this one's for you. Can CRISPR also be used as a tool to reduce the use of other fossil fuels like coal and natural gas? Hmm. So <laughs> those are not liquid fuels. So uh -huh, right. Well, that 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 becomes a bit of a of a challenge. So methane might be the closest one that you could get because you could use a microbe that can naturally consume methane, and then you would engineer it to produce something of interest. But coal, that's a hard one. I'm 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 not sure that that we'll be able to find a microbe that can turn into coal if that's what the question is about. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, one for you. Uh, as the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere increases, will plants be able to better cope with fewer stomata? Yeah, wow. Good question. I hope yes. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into modeling future climate conditions, and CO2 is one of those future climate conditions, but we can't separate it necessarily from all the other phenomena that we expect. And so increased temperature is what I'm thinking about specifically. So you're very astute in saying, right, there's more CO2, so maybe you need fewer sites to be able to take in that CO2. Check, higher temperatures, well, these sites are where water vapor leaves from, and that's called evaporative cooling. The same way that we sweat, plants use their stomata to sweat out their heat, right? And so now we have another trade-off between taking in CO2 and this evaporative cooling process. And so it's impossible to say that there is one ideal stomatal density that's gonna save us all, you know, that's gonna be the perfect amount of CO2. And plants know this as well. And we see plants are quite dynamic in how they accumulate stomata. So over the course of a plant's life, we see in rice, if the plant is experiencing drought, the new leaf that emerges during that drought will have fewer stomata. Um, uh, plants can also be adapted. So 
there are rice plants that grow without being flooded. They have fewer stomata than the plants that have grow in flooded conditions. And so you're really a student saying that stomatal densities can be adapted to a range of environments. And as long as we continue to produce rice globally, we're going to need that diversity of stomatal densities and morphologies to address that uh, the multiplicity of environments that rice grows in. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so maybe this is a question you both can answer. Uh, one of our one of our viewers has heard of DIY CRISPR projects. Um, is there any danger of using CRISPR for for a home project? Um, and I'm going to hold this person to the next sentence they wrote, which is, "I promise not to experiment on the neighborhood kids." I cannot support that as someone who reviews so many institutional review board documents on safety and unintended consequences. Um, you you never, if you're not having an oversight on what you're doing, is it, or is someone thinking about, is the research proposing morally and ethically acceptable? Well, you're on your own. So I, I personally, I, I, I personally can't endorse that. <laughs> Over to you, Nicholas. <laughs> Yeah, I think Thomas is really sharing being diligent and having you all be safe, which is our priority. There are a lot of incredible educational resources that exist around this, including at home kits strictly for educational purposes that have been developed by educators and scientists. And so I wouldn't, I don't know how rogue on your DIY you're interested in going, but I think resources exist that can support you in exploring, you know, the application of CRISPR in a, in a less professional sense. Thank you. I, I, you know, I, the question was a fun one to think about, but I do want to say that both Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley are very serious about safety protocols, so I appreciate your, your serious answer to my sort of funny question. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dee. Yeah, sure. Um, I think we're going to have one big sort of general kind of pie in the sky question before we finish up here, which is in both of the labs. Um, so how do you, what do you think is sort of the pie in the sky? Where are we going? What is the future hold for CRISPR? Are there new ways it will be used to address some of the world's most pressing questions as we've, we know that they're addressing so many already with different kinds of cancers and diseases and agriculture and climate change. Um, so where do, what do you see as, as where CRISPR is going or where it could possibly go? I can take a stab at this one first, if it's okay. Um, sure. I'm really so grateful to be a part of the Innovative Genomics Institute. This was an institute founded by Jennifer Doudna after she demonstrated the application or the use of CRISPR-Cas in vitro. It was a really exciting breakthrough and she dedicated an institute to fundamental and applied research of, you know, gene editing and what, what is possible. And I think the technical, technological innovation is limitless, right? And that's super exciting, especially to me as a technologist. But I think the aspect that I'm really excited about is how we can bring this to farmers' hands, growers' hands, consumers' hands, make this a technology in a household name, because I think there's a lot of power in this technology. And so the pie in the sky for me, and hopefully what I get to work on in my career is really democratizing the use and distribution of gene edited products. And so the Innovative Genomics Institute, beyond being a center for innovation and research, is also thinking about how we can innovate in technology transfer. And so, for example, I recently got the opportunity to visit at the Philippines by invitation of the Filipino government to work with their gene editing regulators and how they would actually be able to review applications for gene edited products. And so I think uh, the sky is also the limit in terms of bringing uh, this technology to the hands of farmers and consumers and so we'll, we'll continue to see a lot of incredible technological innovation, but I think we'll know we made it when we see gene edited products that increase sustainability, that support smallholder farmers, that increase equity actually come to fruition. 
Yes, thank you. It looks like. Yeah, so I just got a chat from Thomas. Unfortunately, his computer just crashed, which is good that it crashed now and not earlier. He uh, He's trying to reboot his computer. Oh, oh he may be Yay. back. Yes. Yay. <laughs> the whole thing went purple. It was very. <laughs> Well, we, I was I was just about to give best regards on your behalf, but I'll let you actually maybe answer that question and do that yourself. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I, I think CRISPR has the, li the limits of, of CRISPR is the limit of biology. Anything that we can think of for for biology will likely be enabled by the CRISPR tool set. You want to engineer a microbe? CRISPR is going to be the way forward. I, I think today's talks are an excellent example of that. You, you saw two very, very different applications. If we can think of it, likely CRISPR and biology can help us. Awesome. Wonderful, thank you. I am sharing this screen because we have one more summertime midday science cafe ready, but we also have, we're already working everyone on our fall series. So don't fret, don't fear. We have September astronomy. We have a midday science cafe coming up in, in the fall on animals. We've never talked about animals. So we're really excited to do that. And electric vehicle infrastructure and the policy around that. Jen, am I missing anything? No, I think you've got it. Um, I'll just say thanks again to Thomas and Nicholas for fantastic presentations. The audience, as always, you guys ask amazing questions. I wish we could get to them all. We, we try our best, uh, but thank you for continuing to show up and, and ask those great questions. I'll also say you can always stay up to date with the research coming out of both of our labs uh, and campuses. So scienceacal.berkeley.edu and lbl.gov. And with that, I think we'll just say see you next month. And thank you again. Thank you, everybody, panelists and audience. Thank you.